Would you take the word of God, please, and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we'll begin reading in just a moment in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 with verse 1. I'm dealing, God helping me, with the seasons of life. The seasons of life. And immediately one's mind goes to age. But we're going to discover that's not what we find in the Word of God. That in any age, the Lord can take you through some experience in life that you would say, this came to me for a season, for a time. And what I gained from that was good for me and glorifying to God. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 beginning with verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Notice please in chapter 3 and verse 1, if you'll mark this expression, there is a season. There is a season. All of my adult life has been given to the service of the Lord. I'm certainly not the only person who can say that. And God put in my heart long ago a desire to be a pastor. <laughs> it's not something someone forced upon me. It's something God called me to do. And I have an inner compulsion to fulfill that mission God has given me. And I've learned in this life God's allowed me to live that there are times the Lord allows me to go through things not just for my benefit, but for the benefit of those where I serve as the shepherd. And I relate to that. And when God assigns something and assigns that season, he assigns it with a purpose. And I learn of him and learn how I can trust him and believe him and be a better servant of his and a better pastor. To you. Notice the Bible says in chapter 3 in verse 1, to everything there's a season and a time to every purpose. I want you to connect those two words, the season and the purpose. The season and the purpose. I admit that you can live through something and never really know why God allowed it in your life. But most of the time, the Lord speaks to his children and helps them to understand at least somewhat of the purpose for this. And we learn something of him. We learn about ourselves. We learn the lesson that Isaiah learned in the sixth chapter of Isaiah when he saw the Lord high, holy, and lifted up. And he said, woe is me. When he saw himself as he ought to see himself. He saw the Lord first and in the light of God's countenance he got the glimpse of himself that he ought to get. And then he was ready to serve the Lord. Some of you 
with whom I speak at this moment, some of you are going through a most difficult season in life. And you're looking for some purpose. In the end, you hope as a Christian to believe God and trust God. If you never find out why, you're anchored in who. The Lord is in control. The reins are in his hands. He's never lost control. And you're trusting him. But you will never find what you need in whatever season you're going through under this sun, on this earth, just trusting in some manward thing. The purpose will only be revealed to the children of God by their heavenly Father. Turn back with me to this opening of this book in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Remember, this is the preacher. And it is the story of the empty king, Solomon. The man who had everything, absolutely everything, in his hands and he was empty handed and everything a man could fulfill to have in his, in his mind the most studious man perhaps who ever lived but his head was empty and in his heart here's one man who said everything I saw that I wanted I took for my own can you imagine having the power to do that how about turning someone loose with an unlimited ability. Whatever they see, they get for themselves. And he did. He had a thousand women, 700 wives and 300 concubines. I doubt seriously that he could call them all by name. Well, they may have had a day of importance to him at one time. But he said, everything I've had to fill my heart has left me with an empty heart. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter one as we begin this sermon of 12 chapters, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he hath taken under the sun? And there's the key to this sermon. Note it, if you would, please, under the sun. In other words, without God, everything on earth, under the sun. Our view of life is either manward or Godward. Constantly the Lord is working in the lives of his children to make our view Godward. Our living is either man-centered or God-centered. And the Lord works in our lives to bring us to God-centered living, beginning with God, continuing with the Lord, knowing there's an inevitable meeting with God and not just man-centered. But every one of us bounces back and forth from that. And the Lord allows seasons in our lives. And he assigns a purpose for those seasons and in those seasons, with those seasons coming and going, the purpose is to bring us in tune with the Lord, to understand life from God's perspective, to have the real perspective on life, the real view of life uh, that we ought to have, that he desires for us to have. No doubt in my mind about that. Who can understand everything that's happening? I heard this, this past week of a 47-year-old man who went to the spine doctor for some work to be done, something simple to be repaired in his back, and he explained how this happened, and the spine doctor said, I don't know how that could have happened to a normal back. But then upon examination, when they were trying to do the surgery, they found out that the man has esophageal cancer and the cancer has metastasized in his, throughout his entire body and he has just weeks or months to live. 47 years old. That can bring life into perspective, can't it? I watched a, a bit of a news presentation on ISIS, this Islamic Jihad, this radicalization of Islam as they call it and the recruiting of 
Islamic people to join this Islamic fight they're engaged in. 15% of the recruits are women. It was rather shocking to me. 15% of the people recruited to go and kill others are women. And they showed pictures of women, European women, English women. One picture was of a female medical doctor in the white medical jacket holding a severed human head in her hand with a caption, I now have the doctor's dream job. Can you explain that? How can someone spend a life preparing, studying, supposedly to save lives, and now as a medical person saying my dream job is to decapitate human beings. We live, as you might imagine, someone would say, in a crazy, mixed up, sin-cursed, evil world. And the Bible says we're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And we're trying to make sense of our own lives. What's happening to us? Why this is happening to us? As we see things all around us and we find ourselves in some season of life. There are 14 contrasts here, 14 of them that I've read to you. The first one says, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And it begins, a time to be born and a time to die. Notice that in verse two. A time to be born and a time to die. Birth introduces us to time. There's quite a mystery about birth. Dying introduces us into eternity. A time to be born and a time to die. People think when they're young that by the time they get old, they'll figure out death and they'll have all the answers. But you meet many people who have gotten old and never figured out the answers to death and dying. Satan works hard in this area. If you'll hold your place here just for a moment, I want you to turn back to the Psalms, would you please? In Psalm 55, we find this word in Psalm 55 and verse four. My heart is sore pain within me and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. I want you to note that expression in Psalm 55 and verse four. The terrors of death. The terrors of death. The Bible says a time to be born and a time to die. It's inevitable. We're going to go through this door of death. The only exception to that is if Jesus Christ comes soon. And death is a terrorizer. Think of it. I had a funeral this past week of a man who was nearly 95. Lived a long life, but he died. He died. Turn, please, to the book of Job with me, would you please? In the book of Job, I want you to go to the 18th chapter. And the Lord says here, as one of Job's friends is involved in this discourse, in Job chapter 18 and verse 14, his confidence shall be rooted out of his tabernacle and it shall bring him to the king of terrors. Would you mark that expression? The king of terrors. The terrors of death. Now, the king of terrors. He rules in terrorizing. The king of terrors. This is death and the devil. We must deal with this. That doesn't mean you think, well, you're going to die soon. No, but I'm going to die inevitably. You are too. No doubt about it. Turn to the book of Hebrews within the New Testament, would you please? This is an amazing statement God gives us in Hebrews chapter two. Somewhere down the line, you're going to meet God in this matter. I want you to be well prepared for it when it comes. The seasons of life, the seasons of life are crowded between 
birth and death. We need an understanding of birth and the opportunity God gives us, introduced in time. Between birth and death, as we're dealing with these seasons, we need an understanding of this so we can deal with these seasons when they come. In Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says, beginning with verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. We're speaking here of the Lord Jesus Christ, who became a man without ceasing to be God, was robed in flesh and lived on this earth. May I read it again? For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now the Bible says there's a king of terrors, the devil and death. There's the terrors of death. Behind all of that, the devil runs around and says, I'm the king of terrors and I have the power of death. And the Bible says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. No question about who he's talking about here. Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine all of your life living in bondage and agony thinking I'm going to die. And the king of terrors running around saying, I've got the power of death terrorizing us. But the Bible says that the Lord Jesus went to the cross and tasted death for every man. The Bible says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Think about it. Jesus went to the cross and faced death. He faced death. And he died to conquer death. Think of that. He used the devil's own weapon to defeat him. Think of it. He died to kill the power of death. And he says, I am he that liveth and behold, I'm alive forevermore and have the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He died to remove that sting. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Oh, the Lord Jesus took that sting out and that victory out. He he gave us the victory through himself. Someone's illustrated it like this. When Goliath came to face David in the valley and David walked down when he put that stone in Goliath's head and Goliath fell to the ground, David took Goliath's own sword, his own weapon. David took the giant's own weapon and cut his head off with it. And the Lord reached out and took the hold of death. As Satan was trying to scare everybody to death and hold him in agony and terror. Jesus Christ took death, faced it, died, rose again, and defeated it with his own death. So we're living between birth and death. And we're going through these seasons. (laughs) Seasons. I have broken a few fingers, broke my nose three times. Don't ask me how, please. I'm a pastor. I can't talk about some of that. (laughs) Broken my ankle and everything healed. Some of you had a broken leg or a broken arm or a broken whatever and it healed, but you went through it. There are seasons of life through which we travel. Where are you now in that season? Where are you? I want you to make just a note or two. Let me say some things quickly. 
we must think about our living. We're alive. We're alive. Some have already met death. Thank God is a conquered foe and the Lord has the keys. He's made the grave a passageway into his presence. But what about our living? Here the Lord places us. If you go back to Ecclesiastes chapter three, where are you in your living? Are you in a time to plant? Verse two, and a time to pluck up. Are you planting or plucking up? A time to kill and a time to heal. Are you killing or healing? A time to break down, time to build up. Is something being broken down or being built up? Are you weeping or laughing? Mourning or dancing? Casting away stones or gathering stones? Embracing or refraining from embracing or saying goodbye to someone? Are you getting or are you losing? Are you keeping or are you casting away? Are you rending? Is something being torn apart? Are you sowing? Are you keeping silent? Are you speaking? Are you loving or hating? Are you warring or in a time of peace? This is our lives. There's a time and a season for these things. It's not the permanence, it's a season. It's a season. And some of us are very impatient about the season in which we're in, but God has a purpose he assigns to the season in the season of life. But this is our living. And we know at the end of that journey of living, there is a time to die. And I hope and pray to God that you've settled all of that that dying time. And the king of terror is no longer terrorizing you because you're trusting in the conquering Christ who rose victoriously over death, hell, and the grave. Our living. Let's write a second thing down, and that is our learning. What are we learning? What am I learning? I'm learning in every season that I need God. Now it's easier for me to learn that I need God in one part of the season. It's easier for me to know I need God when I'm dying, when I'm being plucked up, when it's killing time breaking down time, mourning time, casting away stones time, refraining from embracing time, losing time, rending time, silent time, hating time, warring time. But in every season, I need the Lord. I need him. I need him when I'm planting. I, I need him when I'm healing. I need him when I'm building up. I need him when I'm laughing. I need him when I'm rejoicing and shouting and dancing. And I need him when I'm gathering. I need him when I'm embracing. I need him when I'm getting everything's going my way. I need him when I'm sowing and it's being put back together. I need him when I'm speaking. I need him when I'm loving and being loved and I need him when it's peace. I need him all the time. Well, why the seasons? Because we have the lessons to learn. We have the lessons to learn in these seasons of life. How big is the Lord in your life 
right now. Right now. Not what you hope he will be, but how large is the Lord in your life right now? I had this idea. I really did have this idea that I'd be on some sort of an escalator to heaven and it'd just keep going up and 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 finally I'd see Jesus. I can I could not comprehend. I could not comprehend my wife's granddaddy, who'd been a deacon for 60 something years, falling on my shoulder and weeping when I stood in an altar after I'd announced God had called me to preach and preach my first sermon in my home church and he was there to hear me. I couldn't understand this fine Christian man. Why was he weeping? He had lived more than 65 years in the Lord's service. That doesn't mean that it's bad. No, it's all good. It's all God and it's all good. But why was he weeping? Because he knew that if the Lord worked in my life like he desired to work in my life, I'd go through seasons in life. Seasons. And I would have great lessons to learn. And I needed to learn those lessons. It's awful. You have to go back to some of those schools and learn it again because you didn't get it the first time. The Lord is pretty plain about this right here in this part of this sermon. Look, please, you get down to verse nine. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Now, that's a strange verse to me. The king says, so you work, what do you get from it? You work, what do you get from it? Here's a guy who's a banker. Here's a guy who changes flat tires on a car. Here's a guy who does this, and here's a guy who does it. What profit is it all? It's sort of like the guy in Brooklyn who said, I dig the ditch to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength, to dig the ditch. Then I dig the ditch to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength, to dig the ditch. And then I go back and dig the ditch to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength to dig the ditch, to dig the ditch, to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength to dig the ditch, to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength to dig the ditch, and on it goes. But you know, you could just as easily say, I'm the president of the bank to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength, to go back to the office. You labor and you labor and you labor and you labor and you labor. Look. Look, the point is, do we learn there's more to life than what we do to earn a living? Is our job the same thing as our life? And the answer is no. No. If your job becomes your life, even if you're a pastor, if your job becomes your life, you've got a very poor life. Paul said the Lord was his life and because of it to die would be gain. Look, there's a lot of professing Christians who are not going to gain much at all by dying the way they're living because the fact of the matter is the Lord is seemingly so meaningless. They hate to leave it all behind. They've made a life out of this world and the things of this world. What are we learning in these seasons. Let me put it to you personally. What are you learning and what season you're in? You say, I'm going to just spend my life digging a ditch to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength to dig the ditch, to get the money, to get the food, to get the strength to dig the ditch. I'll buy me a new car to drive to the ditch to dig. I'll get a new sofa to come home to fall on at the end of the day to get a little more rest so I'll go back and dig the ditch to get the money to get the food. I'm going to quit eating bologna and start eating steak 
because I'll get more strength on stake to dig the ditch, to get the money, to get the food, to, to dig the ditch. And finally, I just can't, I just can't go anymore to dig the ditch to get the money, to get the strength. My life is ended now. I won't get to dig the ditch to get the money, to get the strength to dig the ditch anymore. Well, our lives should have been more than that. So he says, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? Verse 10, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in. He said, everybody is going through this travail. No matter what level they're on, if they're sitting in the king's seat in the palace or they're out somewhere far removed, there's an element that's all the same. They're all in travail. Verse 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. In his time. Oh, wait a minute. Here's the way I'm going to live. I, I'm going to enjoy my life after this season. When I get these kids raised, <laughs> I got so many headaches in my house and so much to take care of. These kids are driving me crazy. When I finally get rid of them and get them out of here, we're going to have some peace. And then you're going to sit around and say, oh, God, I miss my kids. And they don't care whether you live or die. Because your house was miserable while they were there. What in the world is going on? Somebody said, well, when I get out of high school, I'm in the eighth grade and I can't stand it. I'm in the ninth grade, I can't stand it. I'm in the 10th grade and I can't stand it. When I get out of this rotten, stinking prison of a school and get out of high school, I'm gonna really do something with my life. Then you sit around somewhere with some meaningless thing going on thinking, oh, I wish I was back with the kids in the high school. My eighth grade year was the greatest year. Well, why didn't you have enough sense to understand that when you were in it? That many people closer to God living a richer life in a hospital room than they are working every day without sickness in an office. Because they learned something in that season about how much they needed the Lord and what life meant. I said to my brother, he's going to, have, going to have knee surgery soon. Pray for him. He's going to replace his knee. I've been waiting for years that they'll do brain surgery on him to replace his brain, but it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, uh, they're going to do knee surgery. Maybe they'll start at the knee and work their way up. <laughs> but I said, you remember our grandfather sitting around at the house and saying, now, boys, when you get old, I want you to understand you're hurt in places that you don't hurt when you're my age. When you get old, your age, you don't hurt like you do when you're my I said, Tommy, you remember that? He said, no, I don't remember. I said, you don't remember much of anything in life, do you? But you say, you know, we had a great life. Find something. What, what do you find in it to be blessed and encouraged by? You know, what, you know what has to happen to people? The Lord works to gain, get them to gain perspective. I thought I was having a bad back till I heard about the guy 47 years old. God bless him and his family who's got just weeks to live. 
I got aggravated the other day in Atlanta airport, running through the airport, hobbling through, and a, and a fellow who had a very, very bad birth defect was going through. He was on the same flight I was on and connected to the same flight I connected on. And by the time he got to where I was going and he was going, his clothes were completely wet with perspiration. And I was complaining. Do I have to get there before I can see any blessing? All of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But very few of you will make any change in your life. It won't be an hour before you're fussing about something else. And by the way, I'll be right in there with you. There are lessons to learn. And the Bible says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh them, maketh from the beginning to the end. In other words, there's never going to be complete satisfaction in this world. It's never going to be perfect. Now I'm going to tell you, when I got married, I found the perfect girl. And I wasn't the only one who wanted to marry her. But she told somebody when we were in the 10th grade she was going to marry me, so hey. <laughs> done deal. The knot was tied. I'm in it. I got the perfect marriage. And then you deal through life with things. One time she and I were in the hospital together in different rooms Serious things they thought. Didn't turn out serious, but they thought. I don't care how perfectly you think it's going to go, there is no such thing on this earth. But every season says to us, you need the Lord. He's the only thing that will truly satisfy. He's the only perfect one. You won't ever find any fault in him. So then I must say this third thing, not just our living, our learning, but our leaning. And I'm finished. We just got to lean on him and keep leaning on him and trusting him and leaning on him. Do you ever get really close to just turning your life over to the Lord? Do you ever get really close just surrendering and waving the white flag and saying, I'm serious this time. We're going to build our lives on the Lord and our family on the Lord. We're going to read the Bible and pray and do what God wants and honor the Lord and be faithful in our service to the Lord. I'm not going to allow myself to get all torn up about this kind of nonsense anymore. I'm, I'm, you ever say that? And then you find yourself in the same mess again. We must keep leaning on the Lord. Keep trusting in the Lord and he's working on us and he's working on us. What's he doing? He's transforming us from the inside out. So no one has to coach me and force me or connive with me to do what's right or get to church or serve the Lord because he's done something in my heart and your heart where we desire him and want to serve him. And we've had enough train wrecks in life where we've done it our way. We've had enough train wrecks even early on where we know that he's the only one who can put us on track and keep us there. There's so much for us in these seasons of life. Let's sit quietly, bow our heads and pray, please. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Francis Abigail, sickly, not a very strong woman, wrote those words. Some of the great things in life come from the weak moments. How many have been through, how many of you have been through something 
that really did change your life because you put your eyes on the Lord and it really did change your life. Would you lift your hand, hold it high? Do I need to add for a time? For a time? I'm telling you, we could walk with him now. Get to know him better now. Serve him now. Father, may thy blessed will be done. Save the lost. Stir the heart of thy children. So little time left, Lord. Help us in whatever season we're in to learn what we ought to learn and to lean heavily upon thee. We need thee. Oh, Lord, we need thee. Every hour we need thee. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, some of you listening have never truly been born again. You cannot be a spiritual person and understand spiritual things no matter how hard you try or how much you want to if you haven't been born spiritually. If you're just holding on to some experience and somebody says, they tell you, you, they tell you, oh, I remember when you were saved. Let me ask you something. Do you remember? Do you know that you've asked God to forgive your sin? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you truly been born into his family? Oh, God is at work drawing people to himself, say yes to him. Say yes to him. Let's stand quietly with our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you've never truly trusted him as your savior, pray right now from your heart and ask God to forgive your sin and ask Jesus Christ to be your savior. Would you pray from your heart now? Dear Lord God, I admit to you that I'm a sinner without Christ. Forgive my sin. I trust Jesus Christ and Christ alone for my soul's salvation. Help me live for you, Lord, from this day forward. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you cried out to the Lord and asked him to save your soul, would you lift your hand, hold it high, you say, I did, I did. Then you leave your place and come. Come now and honor the Lord. How many of you so far away from God, no one would suspect that you're a Christian? Truly suspect that you're a Christian. You say, pray for me. Would you lift your hand, hold it high? Then you come, line up with the Lord. <coughs> do the thing he wants you to do. Some of you are going through a tough season. Why me? Why me? Why not you? Why not me? God's taken that kind of interest in our lives. Right? Why not you? Just give that season to Christ and come and find a place to pray. Pray, Lord, thy will be done. I'm leaning on you. I'm trusting you. Thy will be done. If you'd like for someone to pray with you, they'd be happy to do it. If you'd like to just come to this altar and pray. God has taken the time and the interest in your life to stir your heart this way. Acknowledge him. Will you acknowledge him now in this season? Leave your place now without the music, without singing. You'll acknowledge him now. And let's encourage people as they're coming. Greet them. Smile at them. Help them. Help them. Men, women, young people. Father, thy will be done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.